Great to see you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. Get my clicker first. Start with a question. How many of you either work in or work with a company that's involved in trying to change itself in some way, shape, or form? Right. So could be scaling up, could be trying to pivot to something else, could be trying to move to next phase of digitization, whatever. <laughs> I think it's pretty much all of us. And from where I come from, that's what leaders do. Okay, for where I come from, leaders aren't people who have a formal title or a position. They're people who move a system, a group, a company, an organization from current state to hopefully something better, who work to do that. So I'm going to focus on that. What are the skills that it takes to help an organization move? And the reason why I want to talk about that in terms of the age of artificial intelligence or whatever you want to call it, smart technologies, is because from everything I can gather, there is vast technological capacity right now available. But if you look at report after report, its utilization or the extent to which we get productivity benefits out of those technologies is still pretty slim relative to potential. And the reason for that over and over again is reported is organizational issues, human issues, political issues. Um, and so the role of leaders in this world, at least for the medium term, as far as I can see, is how do we work on those things so that we can catch up. In my field, we call this organizational lag. And for every wave of technology, when computers first started to get uh, adopted and implemented, for every wave of technology, you have this gulf between what the technology can do and actually how it's used by organizations that have outdated systems and structures and mindsets and people who haven't yet learned the capabilities. And so a lot of what we're going to be seeing is that journey. Um, recent BCG report showing how little take up there is. A small percentage of companies are the real pioneers in using all of this. I went to a conference a couple weeks back at CAS, one of the top um, big four firms talking about having observed personally 50 AI implementation projects in companies and none of them scaling due to organizational issues. And so what I want to talk about is how all of us increase our capacity to kind of help <laughs> get things moving in that direction, whether it's adoption of Slack, whether it's experimenting with AI, what does it take to actually make that happen? I'm going to talk about five things. I did my best to make them all be C's, but I forced a little, so I'll explain <laughs> as I go along. <laughs> and I'm going to take them, I'm going to take them in order. And so the idea is, how can we help move our organizations forward? The first is really about bridging and connecting or bringing the outside in. Innovation invariably comes from the outside. New ideas come from the outside. They come from disparate places. And so if we're going to help move forward, we need to understand what's happening in the environment, what are trends, what are opportunities, what are good ideas that we can copy, that we can make better, that we can steal, right? Inevitably, that's what it's about. However, I have been studying people's networks in organizations for close to 30 years now, and our networks tend to insular. We tend to hang out with people like us, who talk like us, who can complete our sentences, who see the world similarly, who are next door, and so when we're busy, we talk to them. And that gets in the way of our capacity to see out and beyond, which is how we innovate. And this is particularly a problem today as we start to implement and adopt technologies that really require us to be kind of in on the ground floor. They're not getting a lot of the innovations. They're not getting rolled out from the top. They're things that people spot from wherever they sit in an organization because of how they interact with customers, with clients, with whomever is relevant, and therefore can bring it in. I'll give you just a fast example. I'm working now with a big consumer goods company that 
tried at first. They, they were very much a pioneer in trying to use AI across the organization. And they tried to do it first in a top-down, very centralized fashion. Didn't work. Started then to go around, talk to people about what kind of experiments they wanted to encourage. This is a, a, a company based in Europe. One of the things that's most shaping how they're doing things came out of Israel. One of their managers in, in the HR function was very connected to the startup scene there, knew a small firm that was pioneering use of artificial intelligence to make matches uh, between people and all different kinds of opportunities and brought them in to, to co-create some things that are very much changing how this organization staffs people on projects, very much outside in. And I could cite example after example. Without that cross-cutting connection, it's very hard to affect change in your organizations. Two, collaborating. There's a lot of things I could say about this topic. I'm going to pick just one since I have 15 minutes. Um, but I think, as we all know, if we've had experience with collaboration, it can be great or not, <laughs> depending on lots of different things. And the thing about collaborating is that usually you're collaborating with somebody that's very different from you. That's the whole point of collaborating. They bring something you don't bring, so they're different, and so it's hard to see eye to eye. Just recently, I've been amused at how often people talk about collaborating with unusual partners, which makes it sound incredibly painful if you happen to be an unusual partner. But anyhow, collaboration is hard because, by definition, you're collaborating when you're unlikely uh, to be similar, and it turns out that there's a lot of research that shows when collaborations are more likely to pay off. And I don't know if you know about this research, um, but Google pretty much replicated what a lot of the academic literature had already said. Um, but they decided to apply their data analytics to try to understand what made the difference between teams that had more effective collaborations on a whole range of outcomes and teams that had less effective collaborations. Does anybody know what that is, what that one factor, key factor is, yeah? It's the way they work together. It's the way they work together. It's the way they work together. In fact, it is, uh, if you boil it down to the essence of it, what they found, it wasn't the composition of the group, it wasn't the common goal, it was this thing called psychological safety that had to do with how they work together. And this had everything to do with the extent to which you felt you could say what was on your mind. You could disagree, you could argue, you could dissent, you could share sensitive information without fear of being humiliated, ostracized, punished, right? Very, very key construct. I'll tell you in a minute how they measured it. The scary thing about this is that this concept at the level of groups and group collaboration comes from research by a colleague of mine at Harvard who studied medical teams in hospitals, where, as you know, it's going into a hospital is one of the most dangerous things for your health because a lot of mistakes happen in hospitals. And so she was interested in studying what makes the difference between teams that have, that make more and less mistakes when it comes to dosage of medication, because that's usually what ends up um, creating death, um, <laughs> essentially. And she, she started off to study this, and she had this really interesting puzzle, because she measured all of these teams according to very standardized measures of what makes a team effective, satisfaction, climate, you know, all the things you would expect. And she found the opposite correlation of what she was expecting. The best teams had the higher error rates. Shoot, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to publish this? What's going on? And to cut a long story short, she dug into it, and what she ended up finding was that the reason for it is because those were the teams that were reporting the errors. The other ones were covering them up. They were reporting the errors, they were talking about them while the others were covering them up. And now, I don't know about you, but I see this kind of thing on an ongoing basis because in a lot of organizations, it is scary to report a mistake. It has repercussions. 
and that gets us into trouble as an organization overall. Now, what's interesting from a leadership point of view is that all the research converges on what it takes to create that kind of psychological safety. But it's the opposite of how leaders have been taught to drive results and accountability. Because essentially what's involved is making sure everybody gets to participate as opposed to you leading with your views first. And it requires a lot of that empathy and sensitivity to be able to say, you know what? You haven't said a word and it looks like something's bothering you. Can you share a bit about that? Having that capacity makes all the difference. And I'm going to come back to the point at the bottom. That means being able to ask good questions, uh, inquiry, as opposed to arguing your case flawlessly, which was what all of us grow up learning how to do. Now, this gets me straight into the next C, which is coaching. Now, I don't know about you, but this is something this is, that's always been around, but I'm hearing a lot about the importance of coaching as a leadership skill set recently. And by coaching, I mean the art of facilitating the development of another. So not the art of telling them how to do what they do better, but to facilitate their development, to drive it from the point of view of what do you want to accomplish, what are you trying to achieve, and how can I help you? And as it turns out, the reason why it's been so important for the current age is that as we have technologies that increasingly provide more and more transparency about data, about metrics, about communication, about monitoring, about all kinds of things that managers used to do. Those things are going away. And so therefore, what remains and what's important is being able to have conversations with people that help them get better. I'll give you what, what I found to be a pretty interesting and somewhat funny example. Um, working with a, a big technology company that has decided that the way that they're going the way forward is to help their leaders develop more of this coaching capacity and so the head of this has been trying to model it himself and they have a whole suite of tools productivity tools that allow people to see exactly how they're spending their time and that's being used as a basis for coaching conversations to increase productivity. And so this manager was going over um, the kind of the, the diary or the metrics with uh, one of his uh, reports. And he saw that she had this chunk of time on her calendar that had been dedicated to forecasting. And so he says to her, you know, what gives? We've automated this. You know, we don't, you know, we don't do this humanly anymore. It's, you know, what, what are you spending your time on? And so a conversation ensued that, in which he essentially discovered is that she felt politically she couldn't stay out of some of those meetings and that she needed to be part of these conversations. And so it ends up being a coaching moment or a coaching conversation about how to say no to things that are not a good use of your time, but people still do for FaceTime or political reasons. Fourth C, connecting, that's a little force. What I mean is being an authentic leader. Um, I've very mixed feelings about putting this up. I think that we overuse this word and it's kind of like authentic pizza. You, you know, if, if it, you have to label it that way, you don't want it. And so, uh, you know, we, 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 we really do overuse this term. It means a lot of things to a lot of people. But the fact of the matter is, particularly as we're going through changing times and there's lots of uncertainty, where we can't tell you this is exactly where we're going, we want our leaders to be real, to be real people, to have a human touch, to, to connect on a human basis. Um, I'll give you one example that has stood out for me recently. I just finished doing a case study about the cultural transformation at Microsoft under Satya Nadella. It's still underway. They've done a lot more than transform the culture, but at the heart of it, what started was 
Satya coming in and realizing that they were just dysfunctional internally, that they were just killing off each other, that people were much more concerned with looking good and getting the right grade than actually serving a customer. He saw it because he was an insider, but he was able to put that together with some of his own experiences, including with his special needs kids, about how to, what he ended up calling, how to facilitate how to, how to grow your empathy for the other and also how to facilitate what he called a growth mindset, which is the belief that capacities that are important aren't fixed. They're actually you could, learnable and malleable with experience. Now, I'm not telling you that transformation is 100% done, but the fact that he was able to talk about it in terms of what he learned from his life experiences that drove a set of values that then he focused on as a leader gave him a leg up in what is always a very difficult kind of process. So being authentic means being real. I'm going to end with um, the fifth C, which is kind of like a meta C, a kind of a, a basket category. All of these things, whether you're reaching out, or coaching, or collaborating, or connecting, they really imply this shift, which is actually what Nadella, the way Nadella described the effort he was trying to, to effect, from being know-it-alls, from being experts, to being learn-it-alls, from knowing what you don't know, and asking questions, being open to what you might discover, because in fact, we're in a world, if technologically what we do is experiment, learn, iterate, that's the same thing we need to do with our organizations. And in order to do that, we have to be, make sure that we recognize what we don't know, we get that information, we pull that talent in, um, in order to make our way forward. So, we we'll stop here. I don't know how I did on time, but you'll let me know. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>